colored content exclusive. Hey, it's Vicki, and I'm here with Keith Walker, the creator of Chemo Sabi. Hello. Hey, so I have some questions for you. Hit me with them. Okay. So, for anyone who doesn't know about the dark comedy, could you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, Kim Asabi is a dark comedy about a man who's no longer in remission, and he's forced to start treatment with the help of his best friend, Death, and his sister. Uh, it's based on my life, actually. I have uh, multiple myeloma, uh, which is an incurable blood disease where lesions can form along the bone. Uh, so, yeah, so it's based on my life, kind of. Because I don't uh, actually have Death as a best friend, sadly. Yeah, I mean, not a best friend, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? So, I mean, I think it's powerful to kind of take your story by letting other people know and sharing your experience. You're kind of getting back some kind of power. I at least believe in stuff like that. Like, when you let people know and you inform people or you make light of it, you kind of take some of the power back. Right. You know, I couldn't agree with you more, mostly because, you know, it, there's this toxic shame that comes from illnesses or that's why a lot of people, I remember when I went to therapy, uh, people would be like, black people don't do that. And I'd be like, black people don't get help. I don't like, I don't understand what you're saying by this. You know what I mean? And uh, I think there is power. There's power in taking charge of what's going on in your life. You know what I mean? I totally agree. Um, since I go through these interviews, a lot of people have said that for Black people, because there is some kind of shame in therapy, um, TV is their therapy. They go to, you know, they watch shows, and sometimes informing people through entertainment is really therapeutic. So what you're doing is great. Thank that you. That kind of falls into what I was saying, what inspired you to create the series, and you kind of already spoke to that point. Uh, there's, there's more if you'd like to hear it. <laughs> yes, I think I would. Okay. All right. So uh, basically, I was diagnosed in 2008, uh, and I was, uh, you know, I wasn't really bitter or angry, um, but it was really tough. And uh, throughout my process and journey, I should say, uh, I began to write. I started to be more observant of things around me. Like, I started to notice like the nurses would be really big, but they'd be giving me like advice, you know, or when my hair fell out, I thought I was gonna look, you know, like Sam Jackson or Shaft, but you know, the only thing I looked like was an ashy Uncle Fester. And I found these things to be hilarious. I found the funny and the most macabre things. And um, I began writing something called Chemo, a love story uh, about a woman I met and fell in love with uh, and she ultimately passed. And uh, so after that, I made it to heal myself and to kind of give it to the world and just to have something for her family to have and what she meant to me. And through that, that was powerful. And I said, this is what I want to do. I want to be a filmmaker in order to help heal people, also educate them and also heal them. And it's a very cathartic experience for myself. And uh, so when I was uh, out of remission, Back in 2012, uh, you know, I started thinking about different ideas and what I wanted to do. And I also wanted to include uh, my roommate involved because I went through a lot of hardships. I was homeless at one point, uh, mainly because people hear blood disease and they think you're contagious. So here's a true story for you. So I went to do a stand-up show in California back in like 2010 or so. And uh, I moved into this new place, settled in for like a week, and then left to do the show. I came back, and um, the guy went through my belongings, and uh, he questioned me about my uh, cancer. And he was like, I just have one question. Are you contagious? And I laughed at first. Because I was like, is, it, is, this, is he serious? Exactly. Is, it, is this a joke? Is like, what yeah. you're... And he looks at me with like tears in his eyes. And he goes, I can't afford to take that chance. I need you to leave. And 
I was just like, wow. And so this is going back to my friend. He was one of the people that helped me get back on my feet. And yeah, it's just, and now it's like, this is what I want to talk about. Cause cancer, you know, it's either you're really young and you know, you have, you're just really angsty and you have cancer, you know, you're young and you're angsty and cancer somewhere sandwiched in the middle there, it feels like in these stories, or you're really, you know, you're not really old, but you're older, you're wiser, you're in that Cynthia Nixon wit category, you know, and I just wanted something in the middle, you know, for people who's trying to pay hospital bills and also online date. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes sense. I mean, I know a lot of people in my family personally I have cancer, some old, some in our age group in the middle. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's so many different thoughts and thought processes that people have um, just in general, but that's bad. That no, the guy thought it was like contagious. He was retarded. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I don't know what to say. That's just retarded. <laughs> um, okay, so like you're answering all my questions i was saying why did you decide to touch on such a t like such a heavy topic um and you kind of went through it you know you want people to you, you wanted to speak from your own voice and you wanted to help right. heal yourself and heal others as well right. um what is my oh so getting into more of the storyline so mm -hmm. miles that's the character's name yes right? miles and yeah sister and the sister is a uh, like movie star. I really didn't understand that. She's like famous. I know that. <laughs> so why did you decide to like kind of? <laughs> why did you decide to like kind of make the relationship or the dynamic that way? Is it because you have siblings? What made you decide to have it be a brother and sister, not a you know boyfriend and girlfriend or? Or a mother and son. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, sure. I do have a older sister whose name is Annette. Uh, her name is Annette. And, uh, you know, I was under the impression that when I was diagnosed, that I was going to have like a fairy tale. Like, I'm not really close with my family. And um, it just, we're just not really close or tight knit. The, Especially, I feel like the cancer has kind of driven a wedge between us. And um, I wanted to, uh, I basically, I, one of the people that I, I really tr truly admire is my older sister, even though we really don't talk. And I love the dynamic between a brother and a sister a lot more than, you know, uh, a relationship. I feel like that's been done to death. And I feel like the way that my sister kind of handled it was pretty much the exact, is the way it's written, pretty much. Mostly, she's not famous, so to speak, but she kind of pretended that it didn't exist, and, you know, and still kind of pretends that it doesn't exist. Um, but I wanted a strong female character. I feel like there's not enough strong women characters, you know, and so that's, that's another reason. I didn't want there to be bogged down by a love triangle. Uh, beyond Chemo Love being a play, what experience do you have in creating um, performances or performance art of some sort? Uh, really, I am, I am not qualified. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I've just kind of, then I'm going back to the hospital. I had so much time to learn, to learn. I didn't watch a lot of TV, I read a lot. And one of my favorite filmmakers is Woody Allen. And I read off I so many bookmarks and, and little notes here and how to become a filmmaker and and Robert Rodriguez, you know, who's also amateur film filmmaker. And uh, I was like, all right, I'm gonna take it upon myself. And I've been very fortunate to hire people who know what they're doing, you know. I think that's like, I know I'm not strong in certain aspects like music. And so I will hire somebody to handle the cues and that, and I could learn from them, you know, editing everything. Um, so slowly, you know, I'm not saying I'm 
completely qualified now, but from Chemo, a love story. I was interesting story. So I met uh, the person from Chemo, a love story from OK Cupid, <laughs> and uh, I invited her to come see the play that I was doing, and she's the one who encouraged me to start doing films, and she helped me with that first one, and uh, she's kind of helped me with this one, kind of been a, a, a mentor of sorts uh, of helping me uh, here, and so yeah, yeah. I'm I, I'm not gonna say I'm I'm the bomb. I'm awesome. I'm, you know, but I I'm very proud of the work that I've done. You know, it's it's a lot of work. You know, somebody asked me like, "What do you think being being a good director means?" And I was like, "The last man standing." <laughs> You know, being up late at night, looking at the footage, doing your research on everything and anything, lenses, anything. And uh, I'll share with you a quote that, that really hit home uh, with me when I was in the hospital. Um, this is when I was uh, during chemo love story, and it's, I feel like it's kind of my mantra in a way. Uh, but near the end of the film, he talks about... Uh, you know, why we do the things we do. And uh, he goes, I believe we're always trying to make things right through art that we could in life. And that really just punched me in the stomach because I was like, I couldn't make my family love me even after cancer, but I, I could, you know, hopefully create something and show that family dynamic of what I think it should be, you know. You're gonna make me cry over here. <laughs> <laughs> you know. uh, but no, I mean, I think it's really compelling what you're saying, and um, I think family loves differently, and especially because I guess I have family who's close, who who have cancer, and everyone's different. Some people want to blame people, and some people just want to show love, and you know. Love is so different. So right. some people may not show love the way you expect love to be, um, but they still may love you. Oh, I definitely think so. I definitely, in their own unique way, you know. And so it's expectations versus reality. Like I was telling you, I thought that there was going to be like this fairy tale happy ending that I was going to have, and there was going to be this, you know, this sunshine of understanding. <laughs> And uh, it didn't turn out to be that way. And so, uh, like evolution, you have to either evolve or die. And so this was a part of my evolution in becoming something better. And what I like to say is, you know, you really don't know what down and out is when you're homeless and you're eating pizza out of the garbage can. You know, you have to crawl out of the uh, primordial soup of mediocrity in order to to really look back and, and really be okay with what's happened to you and where you're at now and where you're going. Yeah. That's a powerful story. Like that, that could be a book in itself or a play in itself, you know? Oh, um, what was, what's my next question? Oh, you know what I, I do want to ask and I didn't even write this down as a question. Why did you choose, even though I love this opening in general, the artistic <laughs> and the, the uh, nostalgic me loves this opening. Why did you choose to do the whole Bill Cosby beginning in one of your episodes? Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. It, it's funny. Ever since I was like a kid, I would have nightmares of being stuck in that Bill Cosby opening. Not that one specifically, but I remember they were dancing and then like fingers like came across and he'd like, and for some reason, yeah, that terrified me as a kid. I don't know why. And uh, I also think this is, this opening from that show is just amazing. I've always loved that particular opening. And I kind of wanted to show that this is not the normal episode with the animated intro. We're going to be doing something completely different. And so that's why. And I, I kept going back and forth about, oh, should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? And I was like, uh, he was like, well, I really do love that damn opening. And you can like something without liking that person who does it anyway. You know, <laughs> like I watch Rosemary's Baby, but I don't approve of, you know, what Roman Polanski did. You know what I mean? 
yeah. so I can appreciate something without having to be like, yes, that person. What tips would you provide for upcoming and fledgling media makers, people who want to do plays, people who want to do films, especially since you said you had really no experience when you started? What would you suggest for them? I would first you have to start with just getting out of that mindset of I can't. I can't has never helped anyone. You know what I mean? And uh, I have no idea how, like, when I made this, I, I wasn't expecting to go to any festivals or do anything big. But I started to notice that I have a clear shot when Chemo, A Love Story started to make it in the film festivals. And I was like, this is what? How am I doing this? And uh, Kimo Sabi ended up in IndieWire. And I was like, what? I've been reading IndieWire for 10 years. And, and people are starting to notice this. And you never know what you're capable of unless you just do it. And so just write. That's just write. Write everything. And when you write, just kind of just zone out. You know, just let everything in and let your mind and your pen or your keyboard regurgitate your thoughts. You can always cut the fat later. You can always cut the fat later. Um, yeah, and when you film it, I would definitely recommend hiring people who could help you, who you could learn from, you know. Um, yeah, because I would, me personally, I would hate to get to the stage of where I think I know everything. That would be a very sad day and I think we always should be learning. Oh, um, we're almost like one more question after this, but I always ask everyone, being a media maker of color, how has digital media been a game changer? And I think this is relevant to certain age groups. Um, when I ask people a little bit younger, they're like, huh, game changer? Because they've always had YouTube and they've always um, had, or seem to always have had YouTube um, but people a little bit older kind of understand like, okay, there is a, there is a difference. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how is um, digital media mm -hmm. been a game changer? Being a oh. person of color, how, how has digital media been a oh. game changer? Oh, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. All right, I'm glad that you, you actually asked that because yesterday I received an email that they're playing chemo sabi in hospitals. And it is another way that nurses have reached out to me and other patients have reached out to me that they've been watching it in hospitals and they've been showing it to different patients. And that just, I'm beaming from that because that's exactly what it's supposed to do. They can go on YouTube, they can go on Vimeo and they could just watch you know, my journey and go, hey, that's what I'm going through. And I have a lot of emails that says, uh, talking about different plot points and I get to hear or read rather, uh, you know, their experience. And it's just, it's an amazing experience. Mostly, especially for African Americans, cause like I was talking about earlier, you know, we don't talk about getting sick or diabetes or these, I feel like these things are just hush, you know, hushed upon. And uh, yeah, that's, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really good for my demographic and what I'm trying to reach. Because when I was going through treatment in 2008, I just sat there and watched a bunch of women, you know, crochet. And that was basically it and read, you know, and so, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, th I think that's, as, as far as my demographic, that's, I'm most proud of that, knowing that other people have something to watch that they can relate to as far as cancer goes. I hope I answered it somewhat. Yeah, no, you're able to reach a larger demographic oh, yeah. easily. Um, where years ago, if, you know, you, even oh, yourself yeah. experiencing it, you couldn't see anyone like you on TV and that kind of made you feel lonely. So it's great that people can kind of relate and see it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you created the content in the first place. Oh yes. I just think there wasn't enough people talking about cancer. You know, it's, it, from the way I see it, very dark and lonely. So this is the last question. 
what can we expect from you next? So you have, I think, up on YouTube about like five or six episodes. What's mm -hmm. happening next? You already said you're working on this Twilight episode, so some more episodes coming soon, right? Yeah, we got some more episodes. I am incredibly busy. It is amazing. I I am blessed and challenged. <laughs> blessed and challenged uh so soon i'm be coming out with a uh maybe okay i can't talk about that all right so i'm going to be yeah it's kind of top secret i'm working on some things with some people at soon yes i'm trying to watch what i'm saying just in case they're like you signed this paper you can't talk about this until we release it oh no i've said too much moving on so um one thing that i'm working on uh, is a new short film, uh, basically about uh, Aphrodite. Uh, I kind of want to explore science, sci-fi, and gods, and I think that's going to be a lot of fun. And love and acceptance. They're um, going to make Hercules, the black version. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's about Aphrodite. She has a certain amount of time uh, to basically um, relearn what love is all about, because in this age of social media and tech, we've kind of strayed off. And I also love, I'll give this little little thing away. Uh, when she visits the human that she's supposed to help, he is like, where's Cupid? I don't understand, where's Cupid? And uh, she responds, well, it turns out that making people fall in love instead of you know them falling in love with themselves was kind of frowned upon. You know, you just can't shoot an arrow and make someone fall in love because it's the equivalent to what Bill Cosby tried to do. You know what I mean? <laughs> I so, like that show. I want to watch it. When does it come so, out? <laughs> I definitely will. I just and plus, I wanted to create something really strong character piece for women. I am just tired of seeing, you know, just all these different shows geared towards a bunch of white men. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, where's my sisters at? And so, yeah, that's, I'm really happy to work on that piece. Yeah, I'm like beaming because I'm just thinking about it and moving away from uh, Kim Wasabi. As much as I love it, I'm ready for more. So yeah, that's Yeah, I mean, thing. I know people who are doing like three different projects at the same time. So if you have the opportunity to do what you love, then that's oh, great yeah. and that's excellent. So that sounds great. I'm excited to see it. It sounds like something I'd watch. I love sci-fi. Yeah, it's in interesting. Uh, and this is also for uh, uh, people out there. Uh, Ernest Dickerson had a really good article about um, African Americans who don't do sci fi. And it's interesting because he goes on quite a bit about his dreams and hopes about how he could, you know, he can see a future where. You know, there's black leads and sci-fi dramas and also writers and also horror movies, you know, and it's it's a really bittersweet, um, yeah, it's a really bittersweet, uh, 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 um, uh, not, it feels like a poem the way he writes it, but uh, document. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, if anyone out there thinking about doing sci-fi, definitely do it because we definitely need more representation in us doing it. So Keith, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Thank you so much for having me. All right, well, I'll chat with you all later, bye. <laughs>